Well, I love that. Um, I don't know where to start with all my little comments, just as I settled myself, but that baritone coming at the end there was just quite special. It's a bit like the wine. It's just, it's just, it's just like the wine, you know, they, they left the best wine for last. But my wife was there and she was amazing, lovely, just as you did. But um, that's, you know, that deep, mm, it's like, we could go for another half an hour. Come on. Brilliant. Isn't worship so powerful? Isn't worship, we changed the whole, you, you've changed your whole mindset in the last half hour. Don't ever underestimate the power of what just happened in the last half hour. We cannot stop worshiping. Of all the things they've done in research, the things that keep, that, that where people go astray, the thing that keeps people on the right, on the straight and narrow in their walk with Christ is worship. Worship, worship. Let go, let flow. Give your stuff over to Jesus. We notice that people come in late for church and part of it is, it's, it's, I think, it's this massive intense wrestle that goes over worship. And some of my early days in the church, I, I found myself, uh, I think, sometimes still plagued by demonic and wanting to scream out in the, in the presence of God because when we worship, the presence of God comes and actually darkness has to flee. And so it, can be, it should be actually quite an uncomfortable time. So amazing worship. If you would like revelation, what is the most powerful thing that you can have in your, in, in your life? Message or the money? What, what is it? But Rona, what is the most powerful thing? If I had to say, give you a gift, what would it be? Well, Diane, that's too slow. Diane? <laughs> the Word of God. The Word of God. Okay, what is that? Vessel? Revelation. The most powerful thing you can have is revelation. It's information from God. How do you get revelation? I'm going to tell you one way you can get revelation is you can go and carry boxes for Jesus. And um, it never feels like it. It's a bit like a gym session. You know, you never feel like going. But on the way to go to the storeroom yesterday to clean it out, I said, Lord, I've said this and I'm expectant. And I'm waiting for my revelation that's going to come at some point. It came very late, actually, I have to say. It only came on my way back. I was waiting. I was waiting. And he started to do some deep things. You can't afford not to serve Jesus. You can't afford not to. Serving Christ is fundamental to your spiritual journey. And I'm telling you, you can be in the church a long time and you can think of these moments to go and serve. You need to serve Jesus with your hands. It's not always in your gift. You must serve him in your gift. But sometimes it's doing the things you don't want to do because you get a revelation and that changes everything. No billionaire, I've got through the Forbes billionaires, what they need is revelation. You can have all the money in the world, but no revelation. Revelation is the most powerful thing. The only reason we're sitting here today is because God has revealed, the creator of this incredible universe has, has revealed himself to you. You can't confess that Jesus is Lord, but by the Spirit of God. It is an alpha course. I mean, alpha. I, I, I mean, I mean, my heart just burned. You know when Nicky Gumbel came out here 30 years ago, he came out here to get alpha course going. And I... You know, God is very gracious, but I almost, I posed, so I actually lied. But just, I was so in my passion, desperate to meet this guy, that I, 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 I got a small group, there was a small group of journalists, and I said I was a journalist from Joy, Joy Magazine. And the reason is I wanted to ask Nicky Gumbel a question. Because you, because you can only progress with Christ, and this, is, this whole course is built, about, built around ask, asking questions. The only reason you are not fully alive in Christ is there's an unanswered question deep in your heart. And I said, Nikki, Mark here from Joy Magazine, tell me about the, the Indian guy in Pakistan who's never heard the gospel. How's that fair? And Nikki had to say, it's a big question. And in, in an expert legal, because he's a, he's a lawyer, he just, he just stuck, he put me to the side and carried on. But you know, I got baptized in the spirit in that Alpha course. I don't, I don't think too many of you need to go to Alpha course, but get your friends, the unsaved guys, come, invite them, get them to Derek and Murrican's Alpha course. And I got baptized in the spirit at Alpha course. 
and I forgave my dad in the Alpha course. And only after I forgave my dad did the Spirit of God flow through me. Powerful, amazing. God's on that. And I'm so pleased we're doing it. It's been a dream of mine to have Alpha going. So thank you, Derek and Marikram. So we are on the red letters here. We're still staying in red letters because red letters are brilliant. It's the Word of God. I'm going to quickly recap. And I'm staying where I was um, last two weeks ago because I didn't get to my preach two weeks ago. And so we're staying in this, in this amazing, um, and it's one of my favorite scriptures. You know, I shouldn't say that because it's all favorite. But the words of Jesus, the red letter, radical, radical words of Jesus. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. And Jesus said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It's a bit like that alpha baptism of the Holy Spirit. We are called to become fishers of men. That's what all of us have been called to do, go and fish for people. Alpha is the gods on alpha because it fishes for people. It brings, it gets, come, let's, let's ask those hard questions and gets experts, brilliant, anointed people to answer those questions. And then what happens when you answer the questions, people get radically saved and we catch some fish. Jesus catches fish, God's anointing on the alpha. And at once they left their nets and they followed him. And so just quickly, briefly, what I said last time as a matter of an introduction is there is a broken world out there. There are people absolutely desperate for truth. And I mentioned two, two moments I had, and even in my Easter weekend I was away, and we got into some big questions. And, and my, my, my one friend's wife, she, 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 she'd had a few glasses of wine, and then she started bombing some great big questions. What about homosexuality? What about abortion? And, and, and I needed to be ready to answer those questions. People have got big questions and they lost and they need answers for the question. And that's why you and me and all of us need to go out ready, prepared to bring the lost in and to go and catch some fish. And Jesus is building his church. And I spoke about this reality that what happens when, when, he, when he took those disciples, Peter and James and John, they were, you know, Peter, James and John, they were in partnership together. They were in a fishing business together. And he said, come follow me. And immediately they left their stuff and they followed them. And then we see as this moves on in the journey, Paul, the great apostle, who then worked as well as ministered. And what I was saying last two weeks ago, I was saying there's an identity shift when God and Jesus calls you. Because most times when people say, hey, Tando, what are you? And Tando will say, he won't say, I'm a son of the living God called to fish you. He'll say, I'm a drummer man. And I have a man every time I go on my walk and he shouts, pass the mark. But most times when people speak to me, they say, Mark, what do you do? I say, I've, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I got a very, I cremate pets. But actually what happens is that your identity shifts from you not a musician first, you're a son of the living God first. There's an identity shift comes where you become a fisherman. And, we, and I spoke a little bit about the sacred, sacred, uh, the, sa the, spirit, the sacred secular, what, what, what did I say this? The sacred secular stress. Sunday is sacred. I'm going to work, no, that's no longer sacred, that's secular. And I spoke about this dynamic that we need to change because you're no longer Emil Lutz called to be cutting. You're first a son of the living God, called to bring you into the kingdom. And I also do a few other things on the side. Because 99% of us are not going to be called full time to, to minister to the, the saints and to teach you the works of ministry. We are called. And so your identity shifts. When God called you, he said, Athel, I'm calling you to fish. Karen, I'm calling you to fish. And then you're going to do some other things like Paul did. Paul made some tents, but he was the apostle Paul, called to fish. Huge identity shift. And what, and, and, and what Ian McKellar so beautifully spoke about, and the Quakers so beautifully began to, Ian McKellar, and he's an NCMI legend, prophetic man, said, we, we evangelize the world. In other words, we catch fish by bringing the kingdom of heaven down to earth. And so what does that mean to bring the kingdom of heaven down to earth for Tando and Kangana? It means that he's skilled as a drummer. And as he drums 
for Jesus, what happens is as he's doing that, people start asking questions about Tando because Tando, you seem to run your drumming business in such a way that there's anointing. And what is it about you that is different to any other business? And you see, he runs his business in an evangelistic manner under the anointing of Jesus to attract the question which where a person says, Tando, what is it about you? And at that point, he uses the kingdom of heaven down to earth through his business to invite people into a relationship with Jesus. And so with me and cremating pets, I'm solving a problem of the world. They were landing on dumps, and now we, are, we, we give you a dignified end for a faithful friend. And under the anointing of Jesus, we are changing, we are solving people's problems. And when we solve, and Jesus came to deal with our biggest problem. What's our biggest problem? Sin. And so Jesus deals with our biggest problem. And what's amazing, do you know that God revealed himself to the, Jew, to the world through the Jewish nation and it hasn't stopped? I mean, this is, I've just started reading uh, a book, uh, Startup Nation. Do you know that God is still revealing himself to the world through the Jewish nation? Do you know why? Because of all the nations in the world, they so, they're solving more problems than any other nation. There's more uh, Patents per square capita. There are more start-up businesses. When it, when the, the, the Jewish nation is still sought after for technology. If there's a technological problem, is there a farming problem, is there, if, is there a safety problem, who do they phone? The Jewish nation. Isn't it unbelievable? God is still revealing, revealing himself to the world, to, a Jewish, to the Jewish nation, who don't even, and 70% of them don't even believe in Jesus. The power of belief, the power of traditions that create incredible success. But the point I'm making is when, if, that we must, be, we must be inspired by that to say, if they can do it without the Holy Spirit, how much more can we? How much more with the power of the Spirit in us can we begin to reveal the, and solve problems to the world? And when people, and when you start solving the problems to the world, for, for, when you start solving the world's problems, people will start to ask you, how did you do it? And then you can say, I went and, I, and prayerfully sought the creator of the universe and he gave me the solutions, Jeremiah 33, 3. If you will search for me, I will tell you things that you do not know. And what's interesting is we all have a problem. Because the world is still full of many problems. And the world is full of anger and full of evil. And there's one reason why the world is still where the world is. It's because you and me have not gone out and evangelized the world. We have not gone out and fished for people. And the reason I suppose I'm so passionate, one of the things I'm more passionate about anything is that we release the priesthood into works of ministry. It's not some, and, and, and that's why you keep on hearing us talk about the fact that this is not Mark's show. This is your show. It's you to go and take the word. And when that happens, when the kingdom of God really starts to move through the priesthood, then we're going to change the world. When everyone owns the call of God as you're a fisherman, you're not, you're not a doctor and a teacher and a lawyer first. You're a fisherman first. And when that happens, we see revival. But what's stopping us doing it? And nothing's changed. Our idols. And you say, oh, Mark, what idols do I have? Do you know what happened? Adam and Eve in the garden. It's very interesting that the, the reason the devil is irredeemable is because he's seen God in his glory and therefore it's impossible for him to live by faith. That's why he's completely merciless and ruthless. And the devil is no match for, for Jesus, but he is a match for us. And it's amazing that the devil, before the beginning of time, the devil decided that he wanted to be self-resourced. He decided that he wanted to be God, in other words. And yet he's created. He is created. 
Isn't it so arrogant, and yet we do the same? Isn't it so absolutely arrogant that you, in your createdness, did you make yourself, Rona? Marguerite, did you make yourself? You didn't make you. Who made you? Yet we still, today, act as if we know things. Act as if we made ourselves. As, by, as God says, I'm the potter, you are the clay. I made you. I fashioned you. In, the, in your mother's womb, I made you. Yet you would still think that you know better than I do. And so Adam and Eve get tricked in the garden. And the serpent comes and does this, it did the exact same thing the serpent did to himself. He did to them. He said, but did God really say you shouldn't eat of that fruit? But then you'll be like God, all powerful, knowing good and evil. And they, and they said, I want to be like God. Yes, definitely, I want to be like God. What are, what are you saying when you say, I want to be like God? You say, I'm going to be self-resourced. I can, you can't, do, do you understand what I mean when I say that you're going to be self, you can't, like did you make a seed? All these, like I said, I used to sit in the SPCA and a cat used to, to come, the cat, you know, a cat, the SPCA is on his last legs, the next thing is going to be in my incinerator. And, and, and no one even loves this stray cat. And I thought, we can design the most amazing things, the la, LC, that Large Hadron Collider, you know that thing, eh? you know that, the Large Hadron Collider? The thing that shoots atoms in. I mean, it's the most unbelievable engineering thing that human beings can do. But we couldn't even design that cat with instinct and smell and the ability to replicate. We couldn't even design that at the SPCA. Yet we think we're so incredibly clever. So idol worship has not changed. It has started in the Garden of Adam and Eve, in, in the Garden of Eden. And what Satan does is he always distorts something that God gave. So they sinned. God said, you, there's a problem now. You've actually sinned against me. In other words, you've separated yourself from me. You don't want to be part of my team. You want to be separate. You want to be in disunity for me. But I'm going to make a plan because before the beginning of the time, I, I saw this happening and I'm going, to, I'm going to sacrifice. Death is going to come in and that blood is going to cover over your sins, which is a prophetic picture of what Jesus would eventually do for us on the cross. And so they kill that lamb and the skin covers their shame and their nakedness. Now the devil sees this and then he does his own story. So the rest of the nations also had their pagan festivals and they would sacrifice and then, and, but they put their own twist on it just like the devil always does. God gives us the most amazing thing, sexual intimacy, intimacy between a man and a woman to generate and multiply ourselves and that the fruit of the most intense spiritual exp erotic experience is a child made in the image of both of you and the devil goes and makes pornography. He puts his own twist on it. And so he put his own twist on the sacrifice and so all these Asherah poles, so what would happen, and I'm just going to take the story forward a little more, and what would happen is, as here's Mark, I've just been plowing my land, I've been looking after my sheep, and I'm going to take my sheep, because I'm going to take a tent, I'm going to go and offer it to Jesus. So I take my sheep, I'm on my way down to the temple in Shiloh, because that's where it was in those early days, I'm going to go and sacrifice my sheep, and then I look up, on top of the hill is an Asherah, and what's happening is there's a very good looking lady, and she's got her own big party happening there. And she says, Mark, don't go there. Come sacrifice here. It's the same kind of thing. But we've got a funky music going here. And actually, there's an orgy happening. So it's feeding the flesh. Oh, yeah. And I can still sacrifice. So I take that spare money I have. And instead of investing it into Jesus and coming to the holy worship like we are today, I go up the hill and I engage with the cult prostitutes and I, and I eat meat sacrificed to idols. And you think, yeah, that doesn't happen today. We'll just take a walk down Loambila. What happens today? People make their money, and they take their money, and instead of investing it into the kingdom, they say, well, I've got some spare money. Let me go and buy that nice car. Then if I've got a nice car, yeah, I can be a bit like Solomon, and I can have a few wives here, and I can have a few concubines here. Nothing's changed. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll.
And isn't this the most amazing thing? Solomon, and let me, let me just be vulnerable. I mean, I've honestly looked at Solomon sometimes and thought, he, he, he just had it right. I mean, 300 wives, 700 concubines, all the money in the world. But what was the last thing Solomon said? I've tried it all. I've done everything. There's only one thing that you, you must do is you must fear God. He done it. So Solomon's done it for us. That's the beauty of Solomon. We don't have to do that. Solomon's actually tried everything more than you'll ever have to try. He's done it all. And he, and he came back and he realized it actually all comes down to Jesus. It all comes down to fearing this creator God aligning my ways with his ways and experiencing the fullness of the kingdom from the inside out. There's nothing better than to be in the hands of the living God. And I want to say this. All those lusts that we have, all those things that we are so desire. If we will give ourselves to fishing for people, you'll get it all. You'll get the energy. You'll get the nervousness about, I mean, let's just, be, let's just talk straight. I mean, let's be honest. What happens, I mean, I mean, I speak to a lot of people in the marketplace. They have a big weekend away, successful sales team. They go away, they have a few drinks. Do you know what happens? Adultery. Because there's this little excitement. Oh, this, this, this girl, she's different to my wife. She really likes me. And there's this little ooh, excitement. And then you add a little bit of alcohol and you've just got no sense at all. And, the, and before you've done it, you're like in the Proverbs, you're like a lamb. You're like a, how does it say in the Proverbs? You, you, how does it say Christoph in the Proverbs? Like that guy that's dwarf, that goes down and he just throws it all away. But you know what, when you wake up in the morning and you say, Jesus, who are you going to show me today? And, 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 and you go into the restaurant, or there's a waitress there, or there's a waiter, and, and it's a bit, you're a bit nervous, you've got a word of knowledge for this person, and is this person going to slap you because you just got, God's just something revealed something so deep for this person? Is this person going to punch you? Because as Michael Eaton says, people should be either crying or wanting to punch you after you've, if you've preached the, the, the word of God. It's exciting. You walk in there and you say, ah, I've got a word of God. And suddenly that excitement, you're filled with excitement. You don't have to be excited about the devil's things. You start getting excited about Jesus' things. And you start inviting them into, the, into this journey with God. And what happens in moments like this is you start to experience the intimacy that you so want. Because the only reason you're going and adultering and doing all those things and, and seeking after these lustful idols is because you haven't got the intimacy of people and connection. And as we would start fishing for people and waking up and actually radically, radically saying, I want you, Jesus, I'm, a, I'm a called to fish for people. All those lusts get taken care of. All the deceptions start going away. You know why it's so good to do two things? Start tithing, and we trying to go on some apostolic mission trips. Start tithing. In other words, deal with your cash. Instead of being like those guys that get swayed with their money and they say, I'm just gonna go and spend my money on that idol, give your money to Jesus. Do that, and go on a mission trip. And what that'll do It'll activate the greatest adventure in your heart that you can ever be on. So that's why we do those things. It's not that we only go on mission two times a year. It's that when we go on mission, we get activated in our spirit because you're doing something by faith and you start having some God encounters 
And you realize this is available for me every single day. And when we start to live like that, we say, Jesus, this is an apostolic adventure every day. What is that idol? What is money? What is all these billionaires? That means nothing compared to having access to the one that created all of this and takes me every day and uses my words and my ability and my business to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. And as I said last two weeks ago, I said you've got to start practicing it. Because the more you practice, the more you practice, the better you get. You more practice, you practice, and you get really good at this. And what is this? You, get, you become an expert fisherman. You start catching big fish and small fish. And you know fishermen, have you met fishermen? I mean, they're just, they just so passionate about fishing. There's like this, there's this adrenaline rush. There's this, um, uh, it's, it's like a, how do you say this? Um, uh, with these, these occupational therapists, when they talk about um, your sensory, it gives you like the sensory adrenaline rush. We you know when that fish bites, and like your, 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 your chemistry, you know when a golfer hits a perfect ball, you know the feeling. My sister SMS me, I got my first eagle this weekend. She's like, she's on a rush, but she got a first eagle. When you get your first hole in one, or you hit the tennis ball, whatever your thing is, or you, or, or, or you intelligent and you work out a Pythagoras' theorem or something first time, and you get that, Wah! and that's the same rush that happens when that person says, "Mark, please tell me about Jesus." And that person starts weeping because they're so touched by the Spirit because you've just walked in the room. Smith Wigglesworth didn't go through half an hour without being in the Bible. What happened with Smith, with Smith Wigglesworth? He used to go onto a tram, and as he walked into the tram, the people would just start weeping there because the presence of God was so on this man because he didn't go for half an hour. A plumber, a plumber who couldn't even read before he got baptized in the Spirit. He got baptized in the Spirit. Suddenly he started reading, and he started preaching the gospel, and he started healing, raising, I don't know, more than 13 people from the dead. People with no, with stumps on their legs. He said, put it in a boot and the leg would grow out because he just stayed in the word of God. And that's not that long ago. And I'm preaching to myself because I also sit with a phone and Facebook and Instagram and the, the, the next moment, half an hour's gone by and your idols have gone. Your eyes have been taken off the one who says, stop being a spectator. Get on the field. Stop playing the game. Start fishing for people. So here's a few things to help us. What's going to make us expert fishermen? Jesus prayed. The Bible says rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You know, when you hear that for the first time, pray. I mean, I, I, I remember. Lord, I can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't pray all the time. Pray all the time. I'm, I, I need to do business here. I can't pray all the time. I walk through the pavilion. And I can't now talk to every single person. So it's quite overwhelming when you start actually trying to wrestle. How does it mean to pray? all the time and in our journey what God starts to do because what prayer is is just communication with God and so what happens as you start maturing I've, in my own experience I've started to bring and realize that this it's, it's not this it's this continuous dance Trinitarian dance in the flow of the spirit realizing that there are all these different communications that I can have for God and most of us are the I need help prayer Something's gone down. Jesus, please help me. Please help me. That's most, I think, people's prayer life. Things are really going badly. I need a job. I need you. Please help, Jesus. But on Tuesday mornings at the Citadel, 5.30 in the morning, you know, I, I seriously, I, I, I look at this mosque that's just gone up in Nelson Thomas Road. I mean, how many millions? I look at the Mormons' place. I, they spent 200 million rand. I'm thinking, and these guys wake up every morning, five, one, two, they don't. They don't have the Holy Spirit. 5.30 in the morning, Citadel, war. We're going to war. 
warfare prayer. Bringing the kingdom of heaven down, warring together. Sunday before the service, prophetic prayers. We want to hear God. What are you saying? I want people to come in there because they're here. At this service, people are getting healed. Come here. Let us read your mail. Let us prophesy over you. Get to your friends, to the prayer meeting before the service. God will tell you. You see, he's training us. He's telling us what's going to happen in the service when we start talking there. Contemplative, meditative prayer. You start bringing your prayer life into your exercise and you go walking and running. It's a different dimension of prayer. And, that, and then prayer, I'm not, to, I'm not talking, I'm waiting. I'm waiting as I'm walking. God starts to tell you things because you've just done something. Driving in your car. I start to realize that why, why, why when I pray like this, I go, oh, Jesus, thank you. Oh, Lord, mighty King Jesus. Oh, holy, holy. And then I, I step out and, and then I'm just talking normally. What is that? What are you, what are you doing there? Like, like Seriously? Why don't you just talk to him? Oh, Jesus, almighty King Jesus. No, 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 just say, Jesus, you're the king of, you're the, king of the universe. Because you, what about this? He holds you to account for every careless word you said. So what, when you're having your conversation with your friend, that's not prayer? He's going to hold you to account in the, in the car when that taxi driver comes. When you pull the Christian middle finger. Pasalamos sotorobo. That's the beauty of tongues. You just give them a tongue. Molos sotor, I speak some Russian. Like, it's so inauthentic. Like what, you, you, you're talking to the creator of the universe. Your words, you will be, our words, our conversation should be saturated. Listen, I, please hear me. <laughs> Lord, have mercy on Mark. Communal prayer. It's a different type of prayer. Come and pray together. We're two or more gathered, so I'm there. Strengthening, edifying. Strengthening and edifying prayer. You know, I'm so pleased in heaven that I'm not going to kick my foot when I haven't got my shoes on and stub my toe because in that dimension we can go through walls. And you know, I saw, I mean, I just, there are two things that happen every time I stub my toe. I remember. Jesus, you, 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 they put things through you, and shulubo, sundolo, shulubo. You use the edifying strength of tongues so that you don't have to actually say the words that you really want to say when you're in that kind of pain. Because you see what happens. Americans said it the other day. We don't understand how amazing God's love is, and we are the, our worst, own worst enemy. So what happens is you stub your toe, you say a word you don't want to pray, and you know what it does? It takes you out for the next three days because you're self-condemning yourself because you just said a word that you, you hadn't said for like 10 years. And then you had children. You had five children, you stub your toe, and you say a word that you'd never said because you're under so much stress. And you need the tongues, edifying spiritual act of tongues to help you. Strengthen you. Or, you, or you, you're looking at this idol up there and you say, It's not like, like people get all weird with tongues. Tongues is like just an edifying gift to just let the spirit inside of you strengthen you, strengthen you, strengthen you. I'm in a test match here. We're fighting the good fight. Structured petitioning prayer. Have you got your journals? I, I, I got prayed into the kingdom by a lady that sat with another lady, and she had my name on a list. Have you got your, your, your journals for your home groups, and you're praying for them? There's that structured, and you, and you get before God, and you just pray. I'm praying for this person. I'm praying for this person. I'm praying for this. And you go back and say, oh, my gosh. God, you answered that prayer. You answered that prayer. Meditation on Scripture. God is doing something new with me. I just go through the Bible in the head, in my head, and I just meditate through the whole story of the Bible. And as I'm doing that without just reading it, as I'm meditating and thinking about the stories, he starts to show me things. That are different. That's a different type of prayer. And so suddenly you see how you can bring prayer into everything that you do. Just like Paul says, I'm continually in the Spirit. It's the most profitable thing we can do. We will see signs and wonders and miracles. I'm, t- I, I'm plagued. My, my kids are out again because... We, we have to wrestle sickness all the time. Prayer opens up the spiritual authority it, and into a spiritual realm that we do not see. 
What is the only thing the, Bible's, the, the Bible, what is the only thing that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them? Not how to read the Bible. Well, they didn't have the Bible, they had the Torah. Not how to heal the sick. They said, teach us how to pray. How do you pray? Because they recognized that's where his strength came from. And Jesus would pray for a night and administer healing in a moment. You don't have to, you know, like, shut up, I'm going to get you down, healed, healed. No. If you've done the work then, go in Jesus' name. Be gone. The authority in the spiritual realm that comes through praying through the night. Praying through the night. That's why we have those all night prayer meetings. It's not for us just to have an all night prayer meeting once for us. It's so that you will have your own all night prayer meetings. Because there are times that you're going to have to sense the spiritual realm over your family. Because the enemy is going to come and he's going to come against you. And you get in your knees and you pray the whole night and stop worrying about the fact that you won't be able to survive the next day. You pray the whole night in the spirit so that you can forcefully advance the kingdom of heaven. And as Paul, his energy will be in you. Way beyond what you can think of a mansion. And he'll enable you to work that next day. But you've done some serious business in the spiritual realm. I haven't got to three, four, five, six. Jesus lived in total dependence on the Holy Spirit. You know, we want to make our kids independent. Oh, no. You listen, you just wait. wait. I mean, you think it's bad enough when people are, are, are going to try and tell you who to marry, and then they give you all that advice. Wait till you have children. Huh. See. No, you leave. You don't ever let your children come into your, into your bed. They must sleep now. Do you know that your child is learning either dependence or independence? Are you teaching your child to be dependent on the father? Are my children dependent on me? Jesus was dependent. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit. He worked in the energy of the Spirit. He celebrated well. Jesus was the wine of the party. He came in that party. He turned the water to wine. Are you, when you go to the party, are you the wine of the party or are you the lemon of the party? I've organized lots of parties in my time. There's always someone at least. Unfortunately, in the old days, they probably had something to drink. But they just came and they just started dancing and doing something crazy. And immediately there was electricity in the room. You and me are the wine of the party. Jesus went and saw a party. He said, they need some good wine. And he turned the water to wine. And he was a party guy. And being anointed with the Spirit has the appropriate response to every single one of life's circumstances. And that's why people should be saying to you and me, I want what you have. Because when you're parting, you're the wine of the party. When we were mourning for my friend that was lost, somehow you came and you gripped me and you held me. And I felt so comforted, Ben, you were tears because you could feel my pain as he was with Lazarus. He told riveting stories. Are you practicing your stories? One of the most beautiful things he was as a teacher, any guy that's made any success in his life, they become teachers. Why? Because they start to tell stories. Your story, and it becomes your parable for another person's healing. And learn and practice to tell good stories. I have some friends that take some good, tell some good stories. Who's heard Sid Jolson's stories about no touches? Or Sid talking about how he did his... His acrobatics three times falling on his face on the dance floor here. And, and all of us collapsing in laughter because Sid's taken his life stories as he made parables to bring the kingdom of heaven down to earth. I'm going to have to stop. I, I don't want to, but... <sighs> There's always more. You won't know 
you don't know what you don't know until you start leading somebody else. Otherwise, this is just a Sunday theory. You don't know what's inside of you until you go and stand in front of someone else and say, I want to tell you about Jesus. You're either going to know about him <laughs> or you're not. So we've got an Alpha course going. Every single one of you here is here because you've been anointed. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the creator of the universe living inside of you. Now, please can I encourage you. Go and get before God. Deal with your stuff. Deal with your idols. And then get on fire for Jesus. And it's going to take the city like the prayer meeting was saying. In the name of Jesus. Amen.